Welcome to Transform Now, the podcast brought to you by robotic process automation pioneer, Blue Prism. Digital transformation has the potential to reshape the way companies service their customers, engage their employees, and manage their operations. Whether you're looking to develop strategies, tactics, and best practices to positively impact the future of work, or you're curious to learn how other companies have successfully navigated their digital transformation programs, then this podcast is for you. We're here to help you transform now. Hello, everyone. I'm Brad Hairston with Blue Prism. Welcome to the Transform Now podcast. Today, I'm very happy to have as my guest, Aaron Denman, a partner with Bain and & Company and the leader of Bain's utilities and renewables practice in the Americas. Aaron and I are going to discuss how the utilities industry is poised for so much significant change and the role that emerging technology and other levers will play in facilitating that change. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me today. Brad, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. So why don't you start by introducing yourself uh, to our audience here? Yeah, so as you said, I, I lead our utilities and renewables practice. I'm actually based uh, in Chicago and have been with Bay for you know, well over a decade now. Spent my you know, early part of my career working in public-private partnership helping to commercialize uh, clean technology and then have been doing that work at Bain and Company for, again, over the last decade or so. And, and I think not only do I have this leadership role that, that you sort of mentioned, but I also help play a role across our energy and natural resources sectors, driving integrated solutions very much tied to the energy transition where utilities and renewables are a big part of that change. Excellent. Aaron, I am definitely thrilled to talk to you about utilities and really dive into it. This is one of Blue Prism's top five industries. So we have a lot of customers globally in this space. And no doubt the power and utilities industry is in the midst of significant upheaval. I'm not sure there are many industries that will experience as much change in the days to come as this one. I assume you would agree with that. It's a transformational time. You pretty much open the newspaper today and you'll see some headline related to the transformation that's undergoing. Yes, absolutely. So tell us first, what kind of work does Bain and Company do in the utilities and renewables industry? Yeah, so I, I would say a couple of things. We work across the electric, gas, and even water value chains from, you know, upstream to from production all the way down to the retail side of the business. And across those value chains, we're really advising our clients on their most pressing issues. And now, it's, as we've sort of mentioned already, there's just a number of those issues, whether it's climate change, decarbonization, the ability to transform the grid, the system, the customer experience that's evolving, and then digital transformation, whether it's in the field, into supply chains, in the back office. We're helping our clients on a number of those issues. I would say also our tact is helping organizations from the board all the way down to the front line, recognizing that change needs to happen across all levels of the organization. And while there are some of those issues that are very much top of mind for the board, often we're also helping to drive transformation at the front line in the field um, with utility crews. And so it's an exciting time to be working on a number of issues and to work across organizations to drive the change that's required. And from your perspective, Aaron, what is driving the need for, for wholesale business transformation in the power and utilities industry? Yeah, I, I would say there's four themes that are converging at the same time. And I, most of these probably won't feel uh, terribly novel. There have been themes that have been percolating for, for decades um, and are now coming to a head and again, converging in, in this sort of uh, unique atmosphere where all of these things have to be managed. The first one of those is the global regional industry decarbonization. Again, I think with heading into COP26, which is just around the corner, we're already seeing a number of announcements, whether that's by governments or by corporate clients coming out with aggressive targets for net zero. The utility sector by and large is going to play a massive role in that if you believe in electrification and you see the renewable penetration that's going to be a part, that's a massive change uh, for the sector that is sort of a front and center of an issue that needs to be handled. Right. I, I would say the second one is rising customer expectations. Customers today, all of us, have interactions with new customer models and those expectations 
are trickling into how we want to engage with our utilities. And COVID, if anything, has only accelerated that transformation of, of customer expectations. The recognition that I'm at home and need to interface with my kids on remote learning or a customer who is now um, dealing with, whether it's a you know video conferencing platform, the ability to have reliable, resilient energy to manage that is just paramount. And so the, the customer expectations were already growing in COVID-19 accelerated that. I would say the third one is aging infrastructure, which is compounded by that first one of climate change. The system is quite aged and antiquated. Again, there's differences across the globe, differences across the U.S., but by and large, a relatively antiquated system that needs upgraded at the current present time, a climate change, whether it's fires in California, hurricanes in the Gulf, or just storms rolling through the Midwest here in the U.S., all of those issues are compounding and aging the you know, infrastructure system. And then lastly, coupled with all of that is an aging workforce. Again, a topic that has been talked about for well over a decade of sort of looming aging workforce. But this is particularly a cue when you think about, okay, we've got an aged infrastructure that needs replaced and upgraded. We've got climate change, which is accelerating the need to transform uh, the system. And we've got electrification that is driving, well, it should drive additional demand and all of that being in a more dispersed location. So transmission and distribution infrastructure, all requiring massive upgrades. That is a, a capital outlook that requires significantly more labor in what is a, a tight labor market and an age labor market, which is only going to get exacerbated as we go forward. So, you know, I think all of those four issues are, are there, they're present, and they're converging, they overlap and they amplify each other. And then I think for this sector, by and large, the sector has been known for how do we maintain affordability for our customers, particularly those um, that are most vulnerable. And we think about we need to deliver on investor expectations. And so the ability to manage all four of those primary themes while still delivering financial performance and keeping energy bills affordable for customers. It's just a really complex um, and, and daunting challenge ahead, but it also represents an opportunity for those that can lead, lead the transformation. Wow. That, that is so many different things that are all converging at once. And it's got to be a great time to be a consultant. I would assume you never have to do business development. They just show up at your door looking for your help. <laughs> to, to... I, I, I wish it was that easy, Brad, but I do think it, it's one where I think there is a lot of need and the needs are highly complex. They're cross-functional. They require a different level of engaging with customers and with partners, which are often new capabilities for most incumbent utilities. Not that they can't develop those capabilities on their own, but I think as you alluded to, they are new capabilities. And so how do we build those capabilities? How do we bring in others who have some of those capabilities to supplement what those incumbent utilities are already good at today? That is a big problem or big opportunity uh, right now. Mm. So you mentioned net zero emissions. What are some of the biggest obstacles that utility companies must overcome in order to achieve this objective over the coming decades? Yeah, net zero, 2040, 2045, 2050. <laughs> Whichever time frame you look at, and there's a lot of comparisons of how we'll do that. It is an ambitious goal, and there are a number of obstacles we're looking at at helping our clients. Uh, navigate as they try to achieve a uh, net zero. I would say maybe sort of a macro framing around this is we think about it as getting three things right. The first one is innovation. Innovation is going to be critical on the pathway to net zero. There are existing technologies that we need to rapidly deploy, but there are additional technologies and solutions and process improvements that are going to be required to help us not only achieve our kind of intermediate milestones, 2025, 2030, but particularly in those latter 20 years, 2030, 2050, innovation is going to be at the heart of that. At the same time, the second one of impact, the ability to earn the right to serve, continue to serve customers, which means the system must be safe. It must be resilient. It must be reliable. And so as we think about the pace of change here, that part becomes quite critical to both deliver on this net zero, but to do that in a way that's equitable, that is safe and reliant and, and resilient for customers. 
And then lastly, it's part of that macro theme. Utilities have to deliver financial results to form the capital required. And that aspect is actually quite challenging because we need to do the first two. We need to have the right impact in our local uh, communities. We need to have innovation, but we have to do it at a pace that allows us to provide financial results to form the capital and achieve the transformation required. And a lot of that starts to get into some of the more tactical obstacles, regulatory being a really important obstacle that I think collectively the industry is waking up to, whether it's permitting for transmission for onshore solar, onshore wind, whether it's offshore wind and how do we permit those locations. Today, the timeframes could be anywhere from seven to 10 plus years to fully get those projects online. That's a timeline that we'll have to accelerate. And there's going to be a bunch of new innovations in how we do permitting, how we do policy to drive that. And then I think the aspect of climate change happening in the midst of this transformation is going to make things feel bumpy and rocky along the way. So how do we stay the course, but manage that transition? Again, we're already seeing it now, whether it's in California or the UK or what we recently saw with Ida and, and Yuri down in Texas, the, the transformation is underway, but it will be up will be in Rocky. And so how do we navigate that through this transition it is one of those difficult challenges that those executive teams are going to have to manage all three of those kind of macro elements, the innovation, the impact, and the financial returns have to be in balance uh, to be able to manage this mm. transition. Yeah. Interesting. Aaron, what workforce dynamics exist in this industry that must be addressed? One of the things we talked about before was the aging workforce and that dynamic of a workforce that's aging. But I think also in the midst of that aging workforce, you have a group of really talented workers who have just so much experience and knowledge. And how do we extract and translate that knowledge into standard operating uh, procedures, or how do we use that knowledge to embed more automation, more process changes to help enable and accelerate the changes we bring in new workers. And so that dynamic of an aging workforce and how do we really leverage that cumulative expertise that they've built over the many decades <laughs> is a really critical aspect that needs to be managed as part of this transition. I would also say one of the other ones that we're seeing right now is hybrid work and really thinking about how do we design the future of work? You know, COVID-19 was a, in, in a way, a reset point on what was possible. But as a lot of our clients are thinking about how do we get back to work, it, it's going to be more hybrid um, in the future. And the, this mix of how do we have remote workers in various parts of our service territory or even in other geographies, along with work that has to get done in the field, in the very jurisdictions um, that we serve. And so that will mean a reinvention of critical processes and roles. One example that we're uh, talking with our utility clients right now on is incident command. When you've got a storm, when you have a major outage, how do we staff that and how do we engage collectively as an incident command system to best deliver for our customers so we can get power back on quickly, if <laughs> it's safe, or communicating effectively, doing that fully remote, I think raise some challenges. And so what's the right model around incident command as we go forward? Those are things that our utility clients are working through right now. And I think a big part of that is what are the new modern tools that are going to be required in this future of work? How do we remove lower value work? How do we reskill for the future? We've got field workers who are used to manual or paper-based and we're moving to more technology, more automation. How do we ensure that they're reskilled for that future, but also understand why are we making these changes? Why is the system set up in this way so that the change process could be really built into that? And those newer modern tools should also provide greater transparency around operational and financial data so that line workers, people in the field, supervisors can make better, more efficient decisions in real time. And so hmm. today, a lot of our, a lot of processes and a lot of data may take two or three weeks before it can actually reach the decision maker. And we need to be able to accelerate that. So I, I think the introduction of new modern tools 
is going to change the workforce dynamics. And a big part of that adoption is really going to be rooted in change management. How do we help individuals embrace and use new technology? Right. Aaron, are the utility companies having any challenges in terms of recruiting the, the next generation of workers, given the aging infrastructure, the significant number of legacy systems, older, you know, antiquated systems? I mean, there's definitely a transformation that's in process, but are they having challenges now in terms of attracting the, the new software engineers and others coming out of college? and other places, what does that look like from your perspective? Yeah, I would say it, it's a little mixed. And the reason I say mixed is I think there are a number of leaders in the sector who have a very compelling vision of where their strategy is taking them, the role they're going to play in this transformation, what it means for talent development in the organization, whether that's on the technical side whether that's in the back office, whether that is in IT, OT aspects. So those that have that compelling vision, that view of the role that are going to play in the transformation, not to say that they are having some challenges, but are in a very different place than others uh, in the industry. And then I think what I would say is because the transformation is requiring such new skills and additional work required, is keeping pace with existing hiring is no longer sufficient. We need more workers, whether that's internal, whether that's partnering with external crews to be able to help with work. The ability to keep pace with that, that is challenged right now, which is why the labor market is, is so tight, which I think is driving two things. One, how do we get our message out and change our recruiting to try and drive more into the pipeline? And I think also, for utilities that recognize this labor shortage, how do we get out there and actually drive productivity in the field, productivity through the organization? Right. And that is a, a change in tools. It's a change in processes. It's a change in mindset that a lot of utilities are going through right now. Aaron, how exactly have the increasing customer expectations around things like consumption and impact to the planet, et cetera, how have those impacted the corporate agenda of utility companies? Yeah, it's a great question. Maybe I'll start with, I think the, the industry by and large used to think of, of customers as ratepayers. It was obviously much more complicated than that, but the language in the vernacular was, okay, we've got ratepayers. And I think as customer expectations have risen, it's become clear that the engagement model with customers needs to be fundamentally different. You'll hear some who say, we are absolutely customer obsessed. We need to be thinking about the customer um, all the way through in everything that we do, whether that is how do we turn on, turn off service? How do we think about their billing relationship when they have a particular issue that they're dealing with and we need to come up with alternative bill arrangements? How do we do that in a way that meets the customer where they are versus black and white. So I think what we're seeing is those utilities that are really thinking customer centric, we see it flow into all aspects of the strategy. It flows into how they think about the role that they have on the planet. It has a role in how they think about what it means for individual people, whether those are their employees or uh, the customers they interact with each and every day. And then they build systems and feedback loops to continuously monitor and take what we call net promoter score. That how do we leverage NPS to get a pulse on were those interactions, those customer episodes, were those delivering on the expectations of our customer? And if they weren't, how do we immediately mobilize to get change expectations or change um, the way our customers perceive us in those episodes? And so the leaders are really taking that NPS customer centric, customer obsessed, mm -hmm. you recognizing that you really need to win with customers. And, and we see that acceleration of, of customer expectations is only going to continue to grow for the exact uh, reasons that you mentioned, the ability to have a greater control over my energy usage. The fact that I want more resiliency, that I'm not just reliant upon my incumbent utility, but maybe it's I want to put solar panels on my roof. 
I want to put battery storage into my home. We're seeing even startups who are looking at how do we provide battery storage into rental units in, you know, various cities across the U S we're seeing more control, more transparency in the way that I manage my energy usage and the information that comes the ability to handle multi-channel, whether that's, uh, I need to be able to call in or I need to do something through a mobile device. I, I want to be able to access to get interactions in a variety of multi-channel way. And then just frankly, I want to see a lower environmental impact. We're hearing all of that from customers in this sector. And we think that will be, will only grow and its importance over the, the coming mm. years ahead. Okay. Aaron, where do you see emerging technologies such as AI and robotic process automation playing the biggest role in transforming utilities in the coming years? So I think there's a number of areas we're starting to see initial use cases, and we think that will continue to play out over the next you know, five to 10 plus years. Definitely in the contact center, in the customer experience, the ability to uh, handle call volumes, be able to handle customer cases, particularly the, the topic we just had, using AI to do that. We're already seeing those at the kind of leading edge adopt those technologies. When it comes to credit and collections, we saw this even within COVID-19, the adoption of AI as part of that to understand the customer segments, who was more likely to pay. How do we create alternative bill arrangements to help customers navigate this? That is much more informed by new technologies of AI as part of that customer billing, kind of dynamic pricing models, which is only going to grow as we think about the transformation that is coming. And then we're seeing it into procurement, whether it's energy programs, solar, the ability to handle that data and make trade-off decisions is creating new use cases for AI and robotic process automation. I will say that often what we see in with all of these use cases and the utilities that are really trying to lead here is how do we combine this technology with process changes that allow the technology to really amplify and accelerate the transformation that's underway. Mm -hmm. A good example is recently with one of our clients, um, they adopted a technology solution for the field that was supposed to uh, reduce uh, the time it took to create and finalize a work order. But in, in the way that the process was designed, the crew, the individual employee would have to enter uh, information, the same information often four or five or six different times, depending on uh, the complexity of the work order. And so robotic process automation is a, a tremendous way to massively reduce the time. And then if we think about how do we combine it with process changes where we can even eliminate some of those steps in the very beginning, that combination is quite powerful. We see really demonstrable results when those two things come together. Mm. Aaron, is the aging infrastructure across the industry also driving the need for more predictive maintenance solutions? Yeah, absolutely. A lot is focused on replacement and more modern technology going in. But the aging infrastructure is really thinking, how do we, and again, decide to the customer experience, how do we use more proactive, predictive maintenance um, solutions, whether it's taking, for example, fire risk out in, in California, how do we think about what are the conditions under which this is more fire prone? How do we use new solutions to provide more predictive analytics around what is most at risk and how do we go address those? We're seeing that kind of across, across the, the kind of landscape here, if you will. And I think if you tie it back to customer expectations, they, they would, as much as this sector is very well regarded for rising to the challenge, rising to the occasion yeah. to restore service after a major outage, customers are increasingly saying and hoping that more can be done to minimize either the duration of that outage or eliminate it to such a point that customer doesn't even feel or experience those outage events. And so I think that customer expectations are actually transforming how a utility thinks about its role. Yes, they need to be out and restore service out after an outage, but the ability to really think proactively, predictive around what's required to minimize those impacts is all the more expectation that customers are demanding. Hmm. 
Aaron, obviously there's some very sophisticated capabilities now that utilities can take advantage of. Do you think most of the companies in this sector are, are ready and able to take advantage of these things like drone video or capturing operational data via sensors, leveraging AI algorithms to become more predictive? What do you think about that? I'll, I'll use the phrase again. I think it's a mixed bag. There are, okay. there are some who are already using drones. There are others and some of them, those using drones are also putting uh, sensors out into the system to provide much more operational uh, data. But I would say the vast majority of the sector are just now starting to look at those solutions. Remember what I kind of wait and see how this plays out and where the opportunities might, might really exist. But I, what I would say is though, that even the clients we've worked with that are using drones that are putting sensors out into the system, our experience with them is it's much more than just drone footage and data. Those things are necessary, but alone are not sufficient. You really need a system that sits underneath all of that to make sense of the data that's collected, to make smart recommendations, and frankly, to be paired with operations to really understand how do we use all of this, even if it's a smart recommendation in the context and in the flow of the existing work, how work gets done. And, and I would say most, if not all, are not fully there yet. There's some who are really starting to bring those things together, starting to think about how do we make smart recommendations, the full integration into how work gets done in the core workflow. Mm -hmm. It's not all the way there uh, today, even for those that are really leading. We do think this will be a space where the convergence of newer technologies and data and a system to be able to handle that will come together and be more integrated in how operations work, but that'll still take some time. Aaron, what impact will emerging tech have in the development of renewable energy, including energy storage and, and sources? Can you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, this is an area where as we think about the maturation of the renewable sector, emerging tech is going to be a real catalyst for that maturation and for leaders to really take a differentiated position. If you look at the amount of renewable production, you could take a particular geography, you could take world stats. It's enormous, uh, the amount of, of renewable generation that's required just to transform the power grid. And then if you think about uh, transportation that may electrify, you think about the ability to create green hydrogen to feed a number of industrial hard to abate sectors, the amount of renewable generation is enormous. And so this sector is going to need accelerated development timelines. How do we shrink the full development timelines? We get projects in more quickly, the ability to reduce cost. Part of that is material related, part of that is L&M related, part of that is construction related, but a, a holistic view of how do we reduce cost over time? How do we optimize revenue so that our plants, they're not off for long or we can do things remotely to get them back online. And then we need to, the sector has to think about how do we ensure that what we're putting in is truly sustainable, is truly green. And so a lot of the tech that we see emerging, you see it on solar, whether it's new tech for panel construction. We see enhanced tools that can do uh, rooftop estimating, planning, installation. We're seeing robotic tools being used for remote cleaning technologies. There's a lot of sensor and analytic work going on of how do we proactively address where some of those issues are. And we can either do it remotely or send a tech in advance recognizing just how critical it is to have those plants up and running. We're seeing traceability of the supply chains, be able to say that the materials used for the solar farm were made with fair labor. They use green materials. It's not there yet, but we see emerging tech really driving the development uh, of the sector. And then we talked a lot about just renewable energy in and of itself, but if I link that with battery storage or long duration storage, there's been a number of innovations, new tech, both in the chemistry associated with that, with pack design, but even much more around the software to understand how do we um, best deliver on customer expectations, deliver value for our customer, and be able to handle the variability 
that will be just prevalent when we have a system that is heavily dependent on renewable. So tech is going to be a critical part of making this entire kind of future work. Mm -hmm. It will be a real catalyst for the maturation of the sector by and large. Mm -hmm. Okay. Aaron, you, you've mentioned numerous things that are bearing down on the utilities industry right now. With all the different pressing issues they're facing, where do you expect them to invest most of their time and resources in the near term? What are the top three priorities in your opinion? So uh, the top three priorities we're talking with our clients about are first, setting and leading a net zero decarbonization agenda. And this is an agenda that is both ambitious, but credible. And I think the credible piece is really important. We see a lot of claims, not just within the utility and renewable sector, but more broadly, a big, bold ambitions to say net zero by 2050, but lack enough specificity to drive clarity on interim milestones, particularly around 2030. What will be required to get there? How do we see our pathway there? That is absolutely foundational to not only lead the change, but to communicate to investors, to communicate to stakeholders, communicate to customers. This is the path we're on and the credibility in the details that we provide can give you confidence that we're in this together to reach that ambition. That has to be one of the, the major priorities that all utilities are working through today. Mm -hmm. I think second, as and very much related to achieving that ambition, is how do we create a high-performance team and culture that is truly customer-obsessed? And not to say that the existing organizations aren't high-performance or high-performing, but there's a next level of performance really required to manage the complexity of change and the pace of change required. And this is going to uh, immediately translate into how do we drive improved capital productivity? The, the points we mentioned earlier with an aging workforce, the amount of capital flows, how do we get more capital work done in the utility is absolutely foundational. How do we do that to reduce O&M, not just overall O&M, but as we become more productive, how do we shift O&M to capital? How do we perform better on our operational metrics, the, the, the metrics that customers care about? They often don't think of them as, as safety, safety, but really reliability and resiliency and how does energy interact my day-to-day -day life? How do we really improve the operational metrics? How do we build a diverse and inspired team to your point of recruitment? You need a diversity of capabilities, some of those that don't exist in utilities today, and that diversity of capabilities, a viewpoint of perspective is critical to put yourself in the, in the mind of a customer and what's required to do that and to be able to bring new solutions and ideas that really not only inspire the organization internally, but inspire how you interact with your, your customers. And then I would say that this high performance team and culture has got to be digitally enabled. We, and we say enabled, we think digital and new technologies can be at the forefront, but really, again, as it's embedded into the organization everywhere, that it isn't just a, a digital org and an IT org, uh, forcing it upon the organization, but it's truly embedded into how everything is done um, in the company. And it, so I said the net zero decarbonization agenda, high performance team and culture focused on, on customer. And then lastly, a proactive navigation and shaping of the stakeholder environment. That includes employees and unions. It gets back to customers, regulators, legislators, interveners, financial investors. The amount of change that is happening and the rules that are, are, are being reshaped at the same time are just so foundational to delivering on innovation, delivering on the impact that we want to have for customers, be able to provide the financial returns. And so you need to be in there thinking about it. How do we navigate and shape the external stakeholder environment? And that part is one, again, back to new capabilities, not that existing regulatory affairs or corporate affairs or government affairs teams aren't doing a tremendous job today, but that level of complexity in the external environment and the pace at which they're moving is different. It's different than it was five years ago. It's definitely different than it was, say, 10, 20 years ago. So those are new capabilities, a new way to think about how do we start to proactively engage with those stakeholders to shape, shape the future, shape our role in the transformation that's happening. Mm, very interesting. 
So Aaron, I have one final question for you. As the leader of Bain's utilities and renewables industry practice, what excites you the most about the opportunity to help these companies transform themselves going forward? This sector has always been exciting. It's the reason I wanted to spend my career here, whether it was too, too cheap to meter many years ago, the, the change in, in deregulation. It just seems like it was yesterday we were talking about the utility debt spiral. This has been a sector that has experienced a number of, of changes over the, the past decades. But I really feel like based on the conversation we're having today, hopefully it's clear. I, we think we're in the midst of a, a once in a generation transformation. We'll look back 20, 30 years from now. And while there'll be aspects that look familiar, we'll be shocked at how much change is really, has really happened. And so I think that part is incredibly exciting. It's both a challenge and an opportunity. How do we manage this transition? Well, I'll say at the right pace, we must positively inflect the impact of, of climate change. We need to continue to earn the right to serve customers. We have to be able to deliver on financial returns so then investors allow us to form the capital required to build the future that customers demand, we all demand. And so two of those three things will do. You have to get all three of those <laughs> things right. You have to get innovation right. You have to get impact right. Yeah. You have to be able to get returns right. Mm -hmm. And that is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity for those that can really take a leadership position that can think customer centric future back of, of how this transition, how the transformation will play out. Having that strategy, that view is, is really foundational. And then those leaders saying, we need to build more integrated expertise to navigate these challenges. We need to build more cohesiveness amongst our organization to bring in new capabilities, to start to partner with external parties. Those things are all, um, complex and mm -hmm. challenging. But I also think exciting opportunity for those that can embrace and really take on that leadership role. And so it's exciting to be a part of this once in a generation transformation. And, I, you know, we're, we're incredibly uh, blessed and humbled to play a, play a small role in helping our clients and the sector navigate that transition to deliver on those aspects, to deliver on innovation, to deliver on impact, to deliver on returns. Awesome. Well, Aaron, I have thoroughly enjoyed the conversation with you today. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your insights. I am now even more excited to see how things evolve in the utilities industry. And, and it's really good to know that Bain is playing such a strong leadership role in this transformation. So thank you for your time and uh, be well. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to Transform Now. For more insightful discussions on digital transformation and more, check out our podcast channel where you'll find all of our previous episodes. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player. And if you like what you heard, please leave us a review. For more information about digital transformation and the future of work, check out blueprism.com to learn how Blueprism's digital workforce is enabling enterprise transformation now.